Hi, and welcome to the video for the E2 reaction. E stands for elimination, and the two means a bimolecular rate determining step. The rate of the reaction depends on both the concentration of the electrophile and the concentration of the base. Let's look at the mechanism up for the reaction first. Here we have an alkyl halide, and the entire molecule is known as the electrophile. The electrophile is electron deficient, and we can tell that because the leaving group, the bromine, is delta, or partially negative, and the alpha carbon is delta, or partially positive. Now we'll draw in the proton on the beta carbon. The reaction occurs in the presence of a strong base, such as sodium hydroxide, which we can redraw as Na plus and OH minus. The hydroxide collides with the beta proton on the electrophile, causing the CH bond to break, a pi bond to form, and the leaving group to leave, all in a single step to form an alkene product. This is where the bimolecular rate determining step comes into play. Because the hydroxide is a strong base, it is sufficiently reactive when it collides with the electrophile to overcome the activation energy for a single step reaction, unlike the weaker base in the E1 reaction. So a double bond was created in the E2 mechanism, just like it did in the E1 reaction. Only the mechanism or the process is different. There are other side products generated, water from the deprotonation step, the bromide leaving group, and there's still Na+, the sodium spectator ion for the reaction. In summary, an electrophile reacted with a strong base. The strong base deprotonated on the beta carbon, CH electrons flowed toward the delta plus alpha carbon, and the alpha carbon bromine bond broke, with the electronegative bromine breaking away with the electrons. That left a double bond on the organic portion, water was formed, bromide, the leaving group formed, and the sodium Na plus remained as a spectator ion. So here is a summary of the key elements for this E2 reaction. The alpha carbon for the reaction can be primary, secondary, or tertiary. Notice the difference between that and the E1 reaction, where the reaction really would not work with a primary alpha carbon due to the very high instability of the primary carbocation, unless it were resonance stabilized. The reaction for E1 is variable with secondary and works much better with tertiary or resonance stabilized carbocations. The leaving group needs to be good for an E2 reaction, just like with the E1 and SN1 reactions, and with SN2 reaction when we get there. Remember that a good leaving group is also a weak base and is therefore relatively stable. The base for the E2 reaction needs to be strong. The size of the base affects the regiochemical outcome of the reaction. Polar aprotic solvents work best, but the reaction can proceed in polar protic solvents. In terms of stereochemistry, the proton and the leaving group must be anti-periplanar. For the regiochemistry, that's the location of the reaction, in this case the location of the final double bond. Provided that the stereochemical requirements have been met, small strong bases lead to the most substituted alkene, known as the Zaitsev product. Bulky strong bases lead to the least substituted alkene, known as the Hoffman product. Now let's dive into some of those details. So the major thing to remember is that a strong base is needed for the E2 reaction. What's considered to be strong enough? In this case, the base's conjugate acid usually needs to have a pKa value of greater than 10. Sodium hydroxide is a standard example of a strong base for an E2 reaction. Remember, whenever you see a metal nonmetal, you can dissociate that into its composite ions. We're focusing on the hydroxide, Hydroxide has a pKa of its conjugate acid of about 15.7, which is greater than 10. That tells us that the hydroxide base is strong enough for an E2 reaction. Similar to hydroxide, other good strong bases are in the alkoxide category, OR-, which might be methoxide, ethoxide, essentially O- with other alkyl groups there. Amines can also be strong enough bases for the reaction. So an example there might be something like triethylamine, which has a pKa of its conjugate acid of about 11. Now I mentioned earlier that the size of the base is important in terms of the regiochemistry of the reaction. Small, strong bases are ones that are not very sterically hindered. So an example could be hydroxide, with just a little proton next to the basic atom. Hydride is another example of a classic strong base, and it never acts as a nucleophile. These bases have pKa's of their conjugate acids of 15.7 and 35, respectively. Now in terms of bulky strong bases, one example is called DBU. And I'll draw it out for you here to see the structure, because that will tell us why it's so bulky. Honig's base, or diisopropyl ethylamine, is another bulky base. Notice all the branching around the basic nitrogen atom. 
The pKa of its conjugate acid is about 11. Both are strong enough to act as bases for the E2 reaction. For the size of the base to affect the outcome of the reaction, stereochemical requirements first have to be met. Specifically for the E2 reaction, the hydrogen being removed and the leaving group have to be anti-periplanar. We can see that best in a Newman projection. If I imagine looking down that center CC bond, I'm going to put the leftmost carbon at the front and the right-hand alpha carbon with the leaving group at the back, and I draw a Newman projection of that. So the H and the leaving group have to be anti, which means on opposite sides to each other, and periplanar, meaning in the same plane. A molecular orbital analysis is needed to explain that requirement, which will be addressed in another video. Provided that the stereochemical requirements have been met, small strong bases lead to the formation of the most substituted alkene, known as the Zaitsev product. Bulky strong bases give the least substituted alkene, known as the Hoffman product. For example, if we use the same substrate in both cases, and in the first example we use a small base like sodium hydride, the small strong base will extract a proton on the most substituted beta carbon. Electrons flow to form the double bond between alpha and beta, and the leaving group leaves giving us the di-substituted alkene. In the other case, the large bulky DBU removes a proton from the least substituted beta carbon. It removes the most accessible proton because it's so large and bulky that it requires more energy to get close to the molecule. The activation energy would be too high for a reaction to be successful at the more sterically hindered beta carbon. So small, strong bases give the most substituted alkene possible bulky, strong bases give the least substituted alkene possible. As long as the stereochemical requirements of having the H and the leaving group being anti-periplanar have been met. So in this video series, we saw the mechanism of the E2 reaction, the factors that favor an E2 reaction, the stereochemical requirements of the reaction, and the regiochemical outcomes of the reaction.